What's up, positive bitches? How are we doing today? If you're hearing this episode, you are meant to be here, so keep listening. If this is your first time here or your 50th time, welcome. As always, a sparkle in me honors the motherfucking sparkle in you. On this podcast, That Bitch is Positive, we know sometimes we're going to laugh, okay? Sometimes we're going to cry. But we will always walk away feeling empowered to be our most positive bitch self, That is positive, babe in total connection to with herself. We're all about getting connected to ourselves because when we understand ourselves, we can mold our life to be in accordance with our truest desires. But when we don't even know what we want versus our mom's wants, that is when our life starts to get a little bit tricky, a little bit messy. We have talked about attachment systems before. I'm going to link both episodes where we talk about our attachment systems in the show notes below. After this episode, I highly recommend you check out the show notes and go to those two podcast episodes to understand. One of them talks about which attachment system do you have? Is it anxious? Is it avoidant? Is it disorganized? Is it secure? That's going to be helpful in your love life. And you can also check out Miss Codependent, a deep dive on anxious attachment. Today, we're going to be discussing something I've not yet heard anyone talk about. I've had conversations with people in real life about this, but I've not heard a podcast episode or read in a book where they deep dive into this other part of anxious attachment. We know when you're anxiously attached, you obviously are dealing with anxiety. And it's usually in relation to fearing that your partner is going to leave you, you'll, you'll be rejected, or you will get abandoned. But there's a whole entire other side of anxious attachment that we're going to talk about today. You're not crazy. Your attachment system just might be triggered. And it's so important that we understand the freaking difference. Before we get into it, if you're not yet following me on Instagram, follow me at Vibin with CC, V I B I N with C I I C I I. And you can follow this podcast's account at That Bitch Is Positive on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok at Vibin with CC. If you are going through a breakup and you want to learn how to take your power back, put yourself back on the pedestal, liberate yourself from the pain you are enduring, join the 21 day breakup glow up challenge. And you can also get the calling your power back workbook. That is amazing. If you're dating as well, it's amazing for any time in your life, whether you're dealing with a boss or an ex-boyfriend calling your power back is essential. Both of those links are in my bios on my social media, and they will also be in the show notes for this beautiful, magical episode. If you're looking for high vibe music, you can always look for CCCIICII. You can look for Angel Energy and my other music on all platforms. And not even last and not least, I have reopened my Magnetic Mastery program. It's a 12-week program for you to align with your most magnetic timeline, feel your best, and get the best results. It includes but is not limited to inner child work, shadow work, divine feminine activation, and healing. It's perfectly tailored to you, so we do not miss a beat. I'm opening up this program to only three people. DM me on Instagram at vibing with CC if you are interested in this program. It's magical. The clients I've been working with have had total transformations. It's so beautiful to see. I'm so excited for them and I'm excited for you too if you decide that it's time. It's time to level up. If you're looking for one-on-one sessions, you can also get one of my usual packages. I can give you more info on that. Just DM me on Instagram and we can chit-chat away. Okay, without further ado, let's get into this freaking thing. Attachment systems, what are they? Let's start there. Before we jump the gun, let's get some foundation down. Our attachments are embedded in our body. As soon as we are born, we have to learn how to talk, how to walk, how to connect, how to love, how to interact with others. And all of this gets sucked up and placed in our subconscious mind. 
It's like we're a tape recorder and we're just taping everything we see, experience, feel, touch, and taste. If our parents or parent or caregiver was able to meet all of our needs, which they rarely do, so don't feel bad if you're like, ah, I didn't get any of my needs met, bitch, join in the club, okay? Most of us do not have all of our needs met. It's, it's a difficult process, and we really don't need all of our needs met. We need about 60, 70, 80. That's enough. That, that is enough for us to get a pretty good secure attachment. But the problem is so many of our parents, they're busy trying to get food on the table and a roof above our heads that there are a lot of needs that go unmet. In older generations, they believed if you had food on the table and a roof over your head, baby girl, you're golden. And only now are they realizing, whoa, human beings have a lot more needs than we were understanding. If our parent was there, 60%, 70%, 80%, and able to hold our emotions, whether it was happiness or sadness, and they allowed us to feel what we needed to feel, we most likely have a secure attachment where we feel good with that parent. But if they were on again, off again, or never there, our attachment system didn't fully develop to be secure. This is what happens when (laughs) we experience trauma. Having a dysregulated attachment system is also a dysregulated nervous system. It is trauma. It's trauma. So when we're trying to connect with people as adults or even teenagers and we're not being able to have these healthy, secure relationships, we're thinking something's wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with us. There's something dysfunctional about how we learn to attach. Once we make this relational template as a child, as a baby, as an infant, and we say, okay, when I cry a lot, I see that my parents respond. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So in our adult intimate relationships, maybe we cry a lot. We scream a lot. We make a lot of drama. We make a lot of noise because that's when we know, oh, I'll get attention if I do this. Once we understand and we do this as an infant, how to get our caregivers our attention, we jot this down in our implicit memory and our subconscious mind and we use this relational template for the rest of our life. That's right. That's right. We internalize how our caregivers interacted with us and we take this template and we copy and paste it to every adult intimate relationship we have. It's intense. The beautiful thing about human beings though is that our brain is born with extra fat. We have neuroplasticity, meaning we can rewire our template. We can take back the pen and rewrite how we connect in relationships. It doesn't have to stop at the toxic relationship. You can transform toxicity into healthy love and relationship, but it starts with understanding yourself. Most of the wars we're going to fight are in our own head. They're in our own nervous system. But if we start to gain understanding of why we're feeling what we're feeling, why we're thinking what we're thinking, we're not going to have to go to war all the time. We're going to be able to end those wars, to ease those wars, to ease our own bodies so that we can connect with others in a way that we feel good and we feel secure. Let's talk about... Anxious attachment versus avoidance. If you have anxious attachment, your biggest fear is abandonment. And anxious attachment stems from when our caregiver was there and then not there, and then there again, and then not there. So from my own life, I've dealt with anxious attachment. How did this come about? Well, my mom was brownie leader. She was on recess duty. She was class mom. She was always at my school, always volunteering. But then she would also, not because of me, but because of adult issues she had with my father, threaten to leave. I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I'm going away. And that stirred up a lot of fear within me. I would literally, I wish you could see it. It's sad to think about, but it's also like, it's not funny. It's a little funny. I would drop to the floor like an armadillo and just be like, no, you can't leave. I I remember these times so vividly because they deeply affected me and my psyche. 
when our parent was really, really there and then really, really not there sometimes, she would also be late to pick me up and she would be really busy with my older siblings and I felt really alone sometimes, but then she would totally be there when she was class mom. So it's a really confusing message for a kid to get of, I'm really, really here and then I'm really, really not. And then I'm really, really, really here and then I'm really, really, really not. And then I'm really, really here and then I'm really, really not. Because the whole entire time, I would think, oh no, my mom's not here. When are my needs going to be met? Then she would be there. But even when she was there, I couldn't enjoy it because my thoughts were always, oh no, when is she going to leave? And my needs aren't going to be met again. And I would literally attach myself to my mom because I was so afraid of when she was going to leave again that it really disrupted the way my nervous system operated internally. So it's not that my mom's a bad mom. She's a great mom. It's that she, (laughs) her presence was really, really there and then really, really not, which disrupted how I connected to her, which then told me, okay, this is how you connect to other people. You glue yourself to them and then you remove yourself and then you glue yourself and you remove yourself. And that comes with it a lot of ups and downs and a big roller coaster ride that isn't fun. If you, on the other hand, deal with more avoidance, that is when your caregiver is essentially not physically there or emotionally there ever. So if your parents were drug addicts, if they're working 24-7 and you never got that closeness with them, you've learned to be overly independent. And in today's age, a lot of people are like, I'm an independent woman. I'm like, okay, fucking chill, please. It's amazing to be an independent woman, man, human. However, hyper-independency is a symptom of trauma. That is avoidant attachment. You're not cool. You're not amazing because you're hyperly independent. You're dealing with trauma. In fact, you're not dealing with it. You're suffering right now thinking that intimacy with other humans is a problem. Thinking that intimacy is danger is an SOS signal That is trauma. So we don't want to be enmeshed with anxious attachment and need someone 24-7. We also don't want to need no one 24-7 and be hyperly independent. Our attachment system is a spectrum. And we want to always find the Tao or the middle way. We want to find secure attachment where someone can come into our life and they can leave our life and we're fine. They can come in, they can go over there, they can be close to us. We can also set a boundary. It's about being able to move in and out close and away with a person and not having constant SOS signals running through your body. With avoidant attachment, I also just want to state that your biggest fear is more along the lines of, I fear how my person sees me. I feel how my partner views me. That's more avoidant because you want to be seen as this efficient, independent person. And when you're not, things get a little bit messy. If you have disorganized attachment, that is if you dealt with abuse, whether it be verbal or physical Any sort of abuse, it really confuses your relational template. If your dad is hitting you and saying, I love you at the same time, that's really fucking confusing, not only for an adult, but for a kid. So then in an adult intimate relationship, when your boyfriend is hitting you but saying, I love you, it's still like you're that kid and you're confused. I don't understand. Well, this is what I had in childhood and that was love. This must be love too. So we want to start to understand what our thoughts and what our feelings are actually trying to convey to us so we can take control of our relationships and not have our attachment system control us. The point of today's episode is to understand that whether you are avoidant or anxious or disorganized or secure, your relational template, your attachment system, it's going to color your relationships. It's going to color how you show up in relationships. It's going to color how you create meaning with your partner. It's going to color how you feel when your partner does X, Y, or Z. What I have found, now I've known for a while that this bitch has codependency she's a she's a recovery okay she's in recovery she's a recover period she's in recovery but 
Anxious attachment is something that definitely colored my relationship and my thought process and my feelings for a really freaking long time. In my past relationships, I'm now in a seven-year relationship. I literally, for, okay, I have to say this. Someone asked me when I was at the Spotify party, they're like, oh, how long have you been dating? And I was like, um, I literally forgot because that's how long it's been. I was like, I can't remember if it's six or seven years, but you know, throw a dice and hope for the best. It's been seven years. I found out today. Okay. Anyway, in my past relationships, I always felt, hmm, what if there's someone better? What if there's something better? I don't know. I don't know. Could there be someone that's a better fit for me? I don't really know if this person's great for me. Uh, That I always thought was just a symptom of those people not being the right match for me. And it could have been a little bit of that, But I'm now finding out that that is also a symptom of anxious attachment. Yep, yep. In my past relationships, I was never two feet in. Even in this relationship for a long time, I was never two feet in. My whole MO was jump ship before they can jump ship. Because if you leave them, I just punch my mic, that's fine. If you leave them before they leave you, you are safe and you're not rejected and you're okay. But you have to jump before they can ever jump. Do you know how anxiety provoking that is? If that is how you're thinking subconsciously, Consciously or consciously, baby girl, take my vibrational hand and let's feel this shit out together. Because there is a way to live where you're not in constant stress and it's time we open up that door. It's time we put this past away. We put it to bed. These anxieties are not yours. And it's time that you choose new life for yourself. I told my mom this the other day and I said, you know, I've never felt like I wanted to be two feet into any of my past relationships. It always just really gave me this fear. And before I could even continue, she was like, Cece, that was my whole entire life. I always felt like I might have to leave before I could get left. And the reason I have anxious attachment is because of my attachment to my mother. So it makes a lot of sense that the feelings I'm feeling, she also felt. As I was talking to my mom and she's like, do you think you and Erasmus are going to get married? And I'm th- I'm thinking, yeah, I think. I, I don't know, but I think. And me and Erasmus have been talking a lot about engagements and things. And I have been feeling like, yeah, okay, yeah cool, but there's other things I need to get done first. And yeah, I think so, but I'm not really sure. And it doesn't come from a lack of, I know I love this person. I know I'm in love with my partner. I've been with him for seven years. I know I'm comfortable with him. I know he gives me security. I know we're two peas in a freaking pod. But when we start talking about engagement and, you know, did I fully design the exact engagement ring I want and send it to my jeweler and have him make a mock-up of it? Uh, yeah. That's just me being my little girly girl stuff, okay? This is my thing about engagement rings. I have to wear this on my finger every day. If it's not exactly how I want it or close, No, sorry. If it's not exactly what I want, I can't do. I can't wear something I think is ugly. And it's not about size. It's about the style. I'm 5'3". Sometimes I'm 5'4 when I first get up. That's a thing. Do your Pilates. It will stretch your body out. And I literally tried on so many different rings. Square made my fingers look so short. And in, what was it? A pair made my fingers look very weird. I never thought I'd be a circle girl, but the circle made my fingers look the best. So I was like, okay, Cece's a motherfucking circle girl. Let's go. Anyway, I'm very particular about really everything. And if I have to wear something on my body every day, it has to be something I absolutely love. Do you feel me on that? Like, do you know what I mean? I could not be surprised with a ring. I'd be like, no, sir, no. I don't care if you are Jesus Christ himself. I need to design what's going to be on me. So yeah, did I design something? Did I send it to my jeweler? Did I have a mock-up made up of it? Yeah. Did I try it on? Do I have it with me right now? Yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm ready to get engaged just yet. So 
Me and Razma have been talking a lot about engagement and we're so open with one another. So thank God he doesn't get mad. I don't get mad. We just really talk shit out. And I've been telling him like there are some hormonal things I want to get in check before we make this huge step. There's business things I want to get together. And it's not like I'm never going to not be busy where I can be like, okay, yeah, let me just focus on making this wedding happen. That's never going to happen. I'm always going to be busy. I have my own business. So that's out of the cards. But there are some health things I really want to get in check. I want to make sure my dermatitis has been good to go for a while. I want to make sure I've cleared it out of my body for good. And there are some things I just want to get in a row. And I started to feel pressure of, ugh, like, why am I pushing back so much? And so I talked to my therapist about this and we were speaking about anxious attachment. And this is a part of anxious attachment that no one talks about. I, in the past with Erasmo, have had those feelings of, oh my God, he's out. I feel like I'm going to die. Who is he talking to? What is he doing? I feel like I'm going to be left. I, I know those feelings. So when those feelings come up, it's so easy for me to disidentify with them. Be like, oh, that's just my anxious attachment happening. Not a big deal. I know my body's conditioned to do that. So when it happens, I can shush it away. However, these new feelings of I'm afraid of this closeness was something I was not really ready for. And when I say that, fears of closeness, you would think, oh, that's avoidant attachment. But here's the thing. It's not about what it looks like from the outside. It's about the intention. Why am I being afraid of this closeness? It's not because I've had this hyper-independency my whole life. It still stems back to, ooh, too much closeness is also a possibility that I can then get rejected or left from this person. I have all this crazy intimacy with. And when you think about anxious attachment, here's the thing. Sometimes it would be like me and my mom were glued together. And other times it would be like, mom, where are you? Are you even alive? So when I have long periods of closeness, it makes me almost feel uncomfortable. Again, not because I'm avoidant or have avoidant tendencies, but because I'm not used to that stability. And here's the key word here is stability. If you're used to stability, you probably have a secure attachment. Good for you. You go, Glen Coco. You go. But if you deal with avoidant or disorganized or anxious, you're not used to stability for long periods of time. So when I'm now getting that from my partner, I am still thinking, well, oh God, when is the other shoe going to drop? Or "Mm, this closeness is too much. This is too stable. And it's not that I don't like it. Of course, I love stability. It's I'm not still, I'm still to this day, my body isn't conditioned in alignment with it. I'm not used to it. So in the past, this would manifest as I don't really want to be two feet in any of these relationships. Now it's manifesting as, oh, we're getting older. And if we do want to get married, which my partner does, and I always saw that in the cards for me, We're getting to that point where those conversations are coming up. We've been dating for seven years and people are asking. All of my cousins somehow are all getting married at the same time. I have no idea how that happened. And people are asking. And, you know, I don't want anyone to think like, oh, well, you're getting to a certain age. You should get married. Or all your cousins are getting married. You should get married. That's a terrible terrible reason to get married and that's why I'm not if if I was going to get married right now it'd be because of those reasons I would never do that to myself I'm getting married on my own terms I'm getting the ring I want okay on my terms okay because I gotta wear that every single day but I found it really interesting that these feelings were coming up and here's also another little trick when these feelings are coming up I wasn't like Cece, you're a dumb bitch. I was like, that's really interesting. I know logically I love this person and I want to be with this person, but these feelings of question marks are coming up. Like, should we? I don't really know. For some reason, I have resistance to this. Why could this be? Because I have an understanding of not every thought and feeling is true, it's given me so much more leniency and understanding and compassion when these feelings do come up. 
There is a study done by Marty Hazelton, who studies mate choice and sexuality at the University of California in Los Angeles. And what they were studying was why women prefer certain men and what is going on in their body at that time. They found that the men women choose is less about romance and more about hormones. The men we're attracted to is less about romance and more about hormones. They found that the men women prefer change depending on our menstrual cycle. We want more masculine men on high fertility days, more dominant men, more competitive men on high fertility days, and days on lower fertility, we want men who are more go with the flow, someone more feminine, the nicer guy. Think about it like this. If you're on any sort of pill that affects your hormones, that could be deeply affecting your mate choice. We're not just the soul, the spirit, this essence. We're also a human being, which is the very animalistic part of us. If you think your hormones don't have a play in how you feel, how you act, and who you are attracted to, girl, we have some talking to do. The reason I bring this up is because just like your attachment system can color who you're attracted to, what you're attracted to, your hormones can color this too. So when you're thinking or feeling, you know, maybe I need space, maybe this person's not right for me. And if you're having a cycle of those thoughts constantly, it might not be about your partner. It might not be that this relationship sucks. It might be your hormones are causing you to be less attracted to your partner in this current phase. This is something to think about. Our attachment system, our hormones are affecting how we see our partners. And then what happens is we start doing monkey mind. If you've ever seen a monkey, you've seen it swing from one branch to the other. A lot of us do this with our thoughts where we'll start thinking, well, I don't really know if this person is right for me. What if there's someone better? What if we're not good together? What if we're going to break? And then we just put ourselves in such a spiral. My point is we can't believe 100% truth from every thought or feeling that we have. What are thoughts and feelings? They are the passengers on the plane. We will listen to them, we'll acknowledge them, but we will not let them dictate us. If I allowed my thoughts to tell me what to do, oh my, I wouldn't even have a podcast. I would not even have a podcast. I would never start a TikTok. I wouldn't be in a relationship because so many of my past thoughts have been based in fear. And once you think one thought in a fear vibration, you start attracting more fearful thoughts. Where is your vibration? Are you in a point of fear or are you in a point of abundance? We can't believe every single thing we think and feel. What we want to do is acknowledge it, bring it to the table. Hey, this is interesting. What is this telling me? We don't want to just blindly believe it. Let's say I believed all my thoughts about me and Erasmo. We would have broken up 30,000 times by now. If that was the case, because there have been so many times where my attachment system was triggered or my hormones were doing something a little bit crazy. Hello, we're on a hormonal healing journey right now. Let's give it up for the girlies on the hormone healing journey. I would have broken up with him 30 billion thousand fucking times. But I know that that attachment system is coloring how I'm perceiving my relationship. I know that. So when I'm having those feelings of, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't get engaged right now. I can't get engaged. Oh my God, too much closeness. I can then say, well, wait a second. It's really common with anxious attachment that I will or would chase someone. And then as soon as they were available, I wouldn't want them anymore. I would then go away from them and I would try to move away and move back. I know that I was so hyper vigilant about being left that I would always try to leave first. So maybe these are where these practice thoughts are coming from. Maybe they have nothing to do with my perfectly healthy relationship. That's great. And maybe they have more to do with my past. And I've said this before. I refuse to be a prisoner of my past. I refuse to allow my past to tell me, what my life is going to look like or who I have to be. That's not happening in this motherfucking house, okay? It's not happening for me and it's not happening for you. There's this other idea 
that I find really interesting and it's about the paradox of choice. So when you go onto Netflix and we've talked about this before, you think you have all these different choices to the point it's overwhelming of all these different shows, all these different movies, but really the same movies and shows are projected out to us. The top 10, this is what you should watch. This is what we recommend. We think we have a all these choices, but really we don't. And that's the paradox of choice. We're thinking there's so many things out there, but really there's not. And when I went through my breakup with Erasmo, I was a maximizer, which meant, I'm going to put it like this. Okay. You go to the mall and you find a pair of jeans that fit your criteria, but you're not sure if there's something better. So what do you do is you try to hide the jeans under this pile of t-shirts and you think to yourself, you know what, if this is the jeans, I'll come back and get it, but maybe I should just find another store or another floor or just like one more pair of jeans to make sure that this is a pair of jeans for me. What ends up happening is you go to those other stores and the time you get back to the first store, someone else took your jeans and you're like, fuck. So a maximizer is all about, let me make sure I've maxed out all of my options, all of my choices. I need to make sure. But a lot of times what happens is we end up missing a choice that was just perfect for us, but our idea that there's something bigger, something better got the best of us. Then there's something called a satisfy satisfizer who once they find what they're looking for, this satisfizer will be fine with it. They'll say, oh, this is the right color, the right fit, the right size. Good for me. They don't obsess about perfection. They don't try to see if there's anything else. A maximizer is always on the road to try to find the next best thing or something to top what they already have. And let me just tell you, as a past maximizer, that road fucking sucks. I'm not telling you to not strive to be your best or strive to get to the next level in your relationship or just in a single relationship with yourself. I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm saying act from a place of love and faith, not fear. When I was acting from fear, I was constantly in maximizer mode thinking, what if there's someone better? What if you're not my perfect match and someone's a better match? I was always operating from that point of view that I could never be present and just enjoy the moments we were having. Instead of being present at the comedy show, I was thinking, well, what if there's someone better? And that is just no way to live. If you're constantly thinking, what if there's someone better? You never get to see the beauty, the connection you have in front of your own eyes. Now, I'm saying this from a point of view of if it's coming from fear, if it's a pattern. If your partner is treating you in a negative way and you start thinking, what if there's someone better? This is why we need to invite our thoughts to the table because you need to investigate everything. So if I'm constantly thinking, what if there's someone better? I'm going to investigate that. I'm going to listen. I'm going to acknowledge. But then I, as the dictator of myself, can say, oh, wait a second. That comes from my anxious attachment all as well. If I am actually just being verbally abused every day and I'm thinking, what if there's someone better? We want to invite those thoughts to the table and say, wait a second, why am I feeling this? Why am I thinking this? Because those thoughts do have validity. Not every single thought is 100% truth, but it doesn't mean that none of them are. So we want to acknowledge, we want to listen, but ultimately we need to use our conscious mind to make a rational decision about who we are and our relationships. A lot of my life, I always spent trying to figure out if the grass was greener and I don't know who needs to hear this right now, but baby girl, the grass is greener where you water it. I was so focused on other people's lawns. I never got the chance to water my own. I never got the chance to perfect my own. Instead of spending my energy and my time trying to see if there's other matches out there, I spend my energy and time watering this great match I have right now. So you have to make a logical decision. You need to look at your relationship and say, okay, 
is this somewhat healthy? Like, is, is this good? Are we, are we working with something that can be magic? Is this a positive relationship? Does it allow me to be my best person? Are we pushing each other to grow? Or is he verbally abusive? If he's verbally abusive, we get the fuck out. However, if it's a good relationship and we know it's part of our pattern, it's not part of this relationship that we are questioning and trying to water other people's lawns and getting into our head, I find that it's really, really helpful to have a list of what we want in relationships and use that list as our reality testing. Because when I'm in my own head, it's hard to reality test what's logically going on. But if I have a list of what I want in a person, I can reality test with that list. Meaning, let's say me and Erasmo get into an argument and then those thoughts of I have to jump ship before he can leave start coming up. I can take out my list and say, okay, I want someone who is stable, who can give me security, who is kind, who has a backbone, who is anchored in his divine masculine, who is a go-getter, who is passionate, who is loving, who can support me. When I look at that list, I'll remind myself, wait a second, just because we had one fight doesn't mean I need to jump ship. It means that we need to get through this. And when you do get through an argument, it creates greater intimacy and greater connection. When you have your list, you're able to reality check what's actually going on. If I read off that list and Erasmo had nothing, that would be a signal, okay, maybe the grass is actually greener somewhere else. And it's not that it's a lack of watering. It's that we can't water together. We don't have a good irrigation system going between the two of us. He's not able to water me and I'm not able to water him. So we want to have this list to reality check, reality check. Is this my own thoughts? Am I getting in my own head? Or are these thoughts having validity to them? Is there something actually going on here that I need to look at? Is it that I'm being my maximizer self and I'm just saying that there's more options and I need to see all these options out of fear? Or is this person really crossing a line and I need a boundary? It's really important to also take a pause when you're having these thoughts and these feelings A part of what's going on is your nervous system is being overactive and your signal cry is on 24-7. It's constant SOS signals. If that's happening and you're not able to think clearly, go for a walk, do a meditation, do a yoga class, you need to bring your feet back onto planet Earth. You need to reground yourself so you can actually think clearly and logically through the situation rather than running and screaming through it and being fearful that this really is the end. The point of today's episode is to highlight the fact that there are so many different factors that affect who we're attracted to and how much we're attracted to both current and potential partners. Our hormones affect how much we're attracted to our partner. It affects what kind of person we want as a partner. Our thoughts from our past and our childhood are going to affect what relationships we get into and how much we want to stay in those relationships. Our attachment system, our nervous system, our feelings, our body is conditioned from our past to either chase after relationships, leave relationships, have hyper-independence, so many different things we have been taught to do when it comes to love. And instead of living in in that mishmash past of what we should be doing when it comes to love, what we have been doing when it comes to love, we have to start plugging into our present moment because our present moment is where our power is, where our power lies. You don't have to keep repeating the same dynamics you've had your whole entire life. You have the choice in the present moment to change how you're showing up. How do you do that? Through conscious conversation. Ooh, I'm feeling like I want to jump ship. Is it because Brad is being mean or is it because I'm perceiving that there is a chance that I could be abandoned and so I'm trying to abandon first? Is Charlie being unfair to me or am I sensing that there's almost almost too much stability here and I need some space? We need to understand ourselves to upgrade our life. If I don't understand what I'm thinking, why am I thinking it, what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling this, how am I supposed to make any sort of change? How am I supposed to alter 
my internal reality, if I don't even understand why my internal reality is conditioned in the way that it is? How am I supposed to make these changes? It's so much more difficult when you are walking blindly and trying to change things or thinking that everyone else is the problem. If you keep experiencing the same patterns, there's something that you're holding on to energetically that is causing these patterns to show up. And it's not just energies that affect us, but as we've talked about today, it's our hormones. It's how our body's conditioned. It's our mindset, whether we're a satisfizer or a maximizer. We have to start making peace with our decisions. I think a lot of us don't even trust ourselves that we can pick good partners. And that's causing us to doubt ourselves. If mom and dad have chosen everything for us and we've never gotten in touch with our true self, if we've never made a decision that we actually wanted to make, Well, of course we're not going to trust that we can make the right decision when it comes to a partner. This is about taking a chance on yourself, stepping into faith that you have the power and can outlive your painful past. And it's about translating what your body's telling you. Because those thoughts of, I need a jump ship, they will come up. The thoughts of, I need space, I'm not used to the stability, what the fuck is this, is going to come up. But how you respond to those thoughts and feelings is up to you in the present moment. That's all yours to decide how you want to respond. We're not going to just react and flip out and listen to every thought and break up with our boyfriend 50,000 times. No, we're going to respond and say, wait a second, I'm going to invite this anxious thought to the table. Why is this here? What's going on with you? Let's call this exercise inviting it to the table. Invite the feeling. Invite the thought. Why are you here? Where have I felt you before? Is this from my past or is this from my present? And you would be so surprised. But when you ask yourself these questions, boy, do you get the answers. We think that we have to look outside of ourselves for the answers, but that's just because we never create the space to ask ourselves these questions. We never create the space to take a beat and listen to what we may have to say. If you're questioning your relationship, that's fine to question, but it's not fine to question in a blur, in the fog, in no understanding. If you're going to question, invite your feelings and thoughts to the table and question those. We're so likely to question our partner when we need to question why we're feeling what we're feeling about our partner. I hope this podcast episode has brought some clarity to you. I love you so much. And if you have any other questions, you can always DM me on Instagram and maybe we'll even do a whole series on our attachment system. I find it so interesting because it dictates the thing that we want the most, which is love and connection. And a lot of us have so many dysregulations internally and have no idea how to deal with it. But the first step is understanding. And once we start to gain knowledge, we can then gain power through changing how we're reacting and responding in a way that we can show up as our highest self instead of repeating those patterns. I'm sending you all the love in the world. If this podcast episode resonated with you, please leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It means the world to me. I love reading through them and it also helps the podcast grow, which is super awesome. If you don't want to do it for me, do it for you. Hello, good karma. We can all use some. I've really enjoyed recording this episode. I'm happy to share some updates that are going on with me as well. It's it's fun to do that. And let me know if you guys have been feeling similar feelings. I know on Spotify, you can now comment on episodes. So let me know, how are you feeling? How are you feeling about your current status of your relationship? Are you feeling this anxiety or this want to be over independent? And I will see you guys in the next one. Mwah.